In this episode, I am joined by Dr. Evan Thompson, Professor of Philosophy at the University of British Columbia, an associate member of the Department of Asian Studies and the Department of Psychology, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Dr. Thompson discusses his 2014 book, Waking, Dreaming, Being and takes a deep dive into the self from the point of view of the world's contemplative traditions, as well as the perspectives of neuroscience and philosophy of mind. Dr. Thompson shares his lifelong fascination with the way in which consciousness and the sense of self change across different phases of the wake-sleep cycle, and challenges claims that insight into the self is a means to eliminate suffering and attain enlightenment. Dr. Thompson reveals his own deep practice of meditation, lucid dreaming, tai chi, and Chinese energy arts, and explains how he, as both a trained skeptical philosopher and as a dedicated practitioner, approaches the religious framing of practice and related concepts such as qi and enlightenment. Dr. Thompson also answers YouTube comments from our previous interview, including a clarification of his critique of Buddhist exceptionalism and a response to Buddhists who feel his work threatens their religious affiliation. So without further ado, Dr. Evan Thompson. Dr. Evan Thompson, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. Great to be here. I'm so delighted to be speaking with you again. Our previous episode, focused as it was on both your life story and your book, Why I'm Not a Buddhist. It was an extremely popular episode with much discussion coming from it, as I'm sure you, you can imagine. So I'm so pleased to, to have you again here. Thank you. And we're going to be focusing today on another of your books, Waking Dreaming Being. It's absolutely fascinating. And we'll, we'll get into that in, in a moment. But we're going to start with some YouTube questions from the first interview. Some, you know, I said that your, our, our previous episode produced much discussion in the comments sections and many emails and so on, and it did. So we're going to field a few of those questions here, just a few of them. So the first one, is your book title based on Bertrand Russell's Why I'm Not a Christian? And if so, what's your opinion on Russell as a philosopher? Uh, okay, so that is something I actually do discuss uh, in the book, but I'm happy to <clears throat> repeat here. Uh, the title is related to Bertrand Russell's title, but I didn't actually arrive at the title initially um, through the association with Russell. So the the reason for the title, Why I'm Not a Buddhist, actually came as a result of conversations I would have with people in um, science Buddhism conferences or, or, or meditation retreats where they would assume that I was a Buddhist. And then when I would say, well, actually, I'm not, then they would want to know why. So the title um, kind of came from the feeling of needing to uh, to explain and and indeed clarify for myself in the process of writing um, why I'm not a Buddhist. But then once I had that in mind, um, I immediately, especially being a philosopher and having read Russell and you know studied Russell, I immediately um, thought of Russell's title, "Why I'm Not a Christian." So the 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 similarity there is that um, I'm I'm taking a critical stance towards certain aspects of Buddhism in the modern world, Buddhist modernism, as we talked about in the in the previous interview, and Russell is taking a critical stance towards Christianity. Um, but the difference is that Russell is, um, you could say he's hostile and dismissive of Christianity. And that's not my attitude towards Buddhism at all. At all. I have a deep respect for Buddhism and think it's an extremely important and valuable tradition. So my statement is more a personal statement of how in my life experience with you know, different Buddhist contexts, different Buddhist teachers, I found eventually that I, you know, couldn't, uh, couldn't, despite trying actually in, sev in, in, in um, several ways over, over, you know, different years that I, that I couldn't actually uh, identify as being a Buddhist. And that's not the way Russell is writing. Russell is writing from an outside hostile um, perspective. Also, he's writing in social circumstances in the 1920s when, you know, Christianity has had some extremely pernicious influences in in English society, and you know, in which he's writing, and and you know, Buddhism hasn't had that kind of uh, hasn't had that kind of influence in the modern Western world, in 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 the way that Christianity had in um, you know, nineteenth and twentieth century England. So the context is is also different. So there is you know, to summarize all that, there is a there is a link and there is a similarity, but um, but our attitudes towards religion, you could even say more generally, are very different. You know, Russell is dismissive and hostile towards religion. And that's not my, that's not my attitude at all. 
Yeah, it's very interesting. I wonder, perhaps one of the reasons that Christianity had pernicious influences was its, its cultural dominance. Yeah. And I wonder if, um, I wonder what, if any, similar culturally dominant mm. or culturally, I suppose, relevant forces, would you, if, if Russell, in other words, was to write a book today, Why I'm Not A, what do you think it would be about? That's, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, Russell was a very uh, socially progressive thinker, so he would probably actually target aspects of, you know, capitalism and consumerism. Um, he wasn't a Marxist, but, uh, but he was certainly, let's say, left wing and, and, you know, very, very progressive in certain ways. So I imagine actually today, if he was writing in, um, you know, the Anglophone world, that that actually might be more what he would target. Uh, of course, he would target other things, you know, religious, the resurgence of, you know, religious fundamentalism, sort of fractured, entrenched religious identities. He would he would target all of that, too. And Buddhism, you know, is part of that mix, um, depending on the kind of Buddhism that we're, you know, that we're talking about. You know, there's a lot of different forms of Buddhism takes in the modern world. But I suspect that that would be more his target, actually. Interesting. Another question here. Wonderful interview. This is from Sarah Six. What tra tradition then, I presume, if not Buddhism, with which tradition has Dr. Evan Thompson decided to align? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I, I also mentioned this in, in the book, and this is an expression that comes from, from my uh, university roommate who called me a non-aligned mystic. And, and that's really kind of how I think of myself. Um, I was, I, I've always loved mysticism, you know, mystical philosophy, the, the, um, the sort of mystical sensibility, I suppose you could say. I've always loved that in the different forms that it takes in different traditions. And um, I was raised in this very, you know, eclectic mix of uh, of practices and traditions in which it felt odd to um, to align with one or another. You could say that that sort of, you know, modern perennialist mysticism is its own particular constructed tradition. And indeed, I would agree with that. So, you know, I would in some sense align my, my sympathies very much with um, aspects of it, not not all of it. But it's just to say that, you know, I don't, um, you know, I'm not a Buddhist. I'm not a Christian. Um, I'm technically Jewish. My mother was, my mother is Jewish, and but she wasn't raised in a, in a religious Jewish household. So, so I don't have, um, a, a religious identification, more you could say, a cultural sensibility and identification. Uh, so yeah, so so I think of myself as as non-aligned actually, and and trained as a philosopher. Of course, this gets reinforced, at least if one's trained in philosophy, not in say you know Catholic philosophy or Buddhist philosophy, you know, in a particular religious tradition. One's one's trained to be you know skeptical and critical and sort of pressure test ideas, and that often reinforces, at least in my own case, that feeling of, um, of, of non-alignment. Yeah, yeah. And now a question uh, that's of interest to me, coming from this, yes. coming from these YouTube. Uh, you know, I'm wondering, do you practice or are you, in a sense, mm -hmm. post-practice? I think sometimes the practice, the enthusiastic practice of these various traditions, for instance, um, or techniques, meditation, for example, we were discussing before we became on Qigong uh, and yeah. so on go hand in glove with sort of centralizing a certain sort of view about those practices. And that mm -hmm. I have observed that sometimes when people become critical of that, of, of that central, centralized view, in other words, people become uh, critical of maybe Buddhism, which they had pre previously accepted, or become critical of, say, Christianity, which they, pre they, they, they lose connection with, the, uh, with what drove them to practice in the mm -hmm. first place. So I'm curious, do you still engage in what these sort of traditions would call practices? And how yeah. do you relate to those practices from the position you've just described? Yeah. Um, so practice in that context usually means meditation, um, which is itself a word that can mean all sorts of different things. Um, but the short answer is yes. Uh, I have a daily practice that consists of, of sitting meditation that is, I would say, at, at this, I, I've, 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 I've kind of taken on board different practices over many years, just in my association with different context communities, teachers. And so at this point, the practice is really just a kind of basic, you could say, tranquility practice, um, leading, you know, leading an active, busy life as a teacher and in a university and writing and things like that. Um, 
just a daily tranquility practice of um, mostly centered on a kind of mindfulness of breathing, you could say, but um, not necessarily framed in a in an explicitly Buddhist way. Um, that's that's um, part of my the beginning of my day, and then also um, I practice uh, standing meditation, John Zhuang or or Ne Gung, which comes out from the um, the the Chinese traditions of uh, of meditation and martial arts and, and energetic work, Qigong. I work very closely with the teacher here in Vancouver with that practice, and also with um, Tai Chi Chuan, so the, the the Chinese martial art movement practice. Um, that's that's really how I begin my day with um, with uh, with with Tai Chi, with standing meditation. And then um, with sitting meditation, I'm less uh, disciplined about the sitting meditation than I have been in earlier times. But the the standing meditation and the and the Tai Chi Chuan I do every every day. That's that's very um, that's very uh, sort of set and firm in my in my life. And and that's you know anywhere depending on how much time I have. That's anywhere from an hour to two hours in the in the morning, just just depending on you know what my day looks like um, with my with my schedule. And as I say, I work with a I work with a teacher here in Vancouver, uh, who's um, who's a, a, a teacher of these of these Chinese Chinese arts, and I've been working with him for about uh, about three or four years now. And um, but I have studied those practices with other teachers in other places over the years. Um, it was actually something I was introduced to when I was when I was a kid growing up in the 1970s in the Lindisfarne Association. I first that was when I first encountered these, and I always had an immediate sort of feeling of attraction and resonance to them. Um, so that's, that's basically what, um, what practice consists in. I, um, I haven't recently, but I, I used to, um, you know, take periods to go on, on different kinds of retreats. Um, some of them in Buddhist communities, some of them in Hindu Vedanta communities, uh, going back to the earlier question of alignment. Um, you know, I was raised very much in this, in you could say a kind of modern, Hindu Vedanta sensibility by by my father who who was a, who was raised Catholic but then you know left Catholicism and um, studied yoga and Vedanta and so I was raised in that framework philosophically you could say religiously including its syncretism with Christianity so I'm thinking of you know especially early figures like Swami Vivekananda and Paramahansa Yogananda um, I was um, my the first kinds of meditation I learned were actually those those types of concentration leading into meditative state um, practices from that tradition. And so that's very familiar to me. I, I can easily sort of reside in that, in that frame of thinking and of, and of practice. Yeah. And you said one to two hours a day of that you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Every morning of the, of the standing meditation and the, and the Tai Chi Chuan. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's a significant time investment. Yes. Yeah. 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 Could we talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Viewers may be aware that I've been interviewing a good deal more Qigong and Tai Chi, mm -hmm. sort of loosely speaking Taoism teachers uh, lately on the podcast. And uh, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, different ideas and views, of course, as there are in all traditions in that in that tradition. So I'm curious when you're when you're wor working with uh, Qigong and uh, your standing practice and so on and your and Tai Chi. How do you relate to those practices in terms of, for example, uh, qi, its its uh, ontology, or what you're seeking to achieve with those practices? How do you do, how do you frame it in that way? Is it, is it a health thing? Is it a nervous system balancing thing? Is it an enlightenment thing? Or you know, what what? How do you relate to those? Yeah. those uh, one to two hours is a significant a significant right. investment. That's that's um, right. quite major. Yeah. So at this point, so. Earlier in my life, I would have said, you know, an enlightenment thing, an awakening thing, especially when I was, you know, a teenager or in my 20s. I don't think of it that way now. Um, I do think of it as a health thing. You know, I just turned 60 this year. So I'm conscious of, um, you know, finitude and and the decline of age and and illness and things like that. So it's very it is very much a health related um, or health based thing in a way that's maybe well, I was going to say of primary importance, but I'm not so sure. That's actually not quite right. It is, it it is of fundamental importance. But I would also say at this point, because I've done these practices for so long, they are just ends in themselves for me. They are. I find them intrinsically, um, aesthetically beautiful, pleasing, valuable, 
um, they help the stability and clarity of the of the body and mind. So you could say that's energetic, um, energetic uh, benefits. Um, and it's a bit like, you know, learning, learning an instrument or learning a skill that at a, at a certain point, you just you just come to love it for its for itself. And, and that's, that's where it is for me. I mean, there are other aspects of it I enjoy. And, you know, in, in, in Taiji, there's, um, you know, there, there are sort of more martial arts ways that you can practice it with either, you know, push hands or sparring or things like that. I don't really do, sp I did sparring a little bit when I was younger. I don't really do that now. You know, I'm just like, I'm 60. I don't want to do that kind of stuff anymore. But, um, but the push hands um, kind of, uh, cooperative competitive practice where you're really exploring your own, um relationship to balance and um force on you and how to deal with force um that i find uh fascinating and and intrinsically valuable and i like to sort of you know test myself in terms of my um ability or lack thereof um in those contexts the teacher i work with in vancouver is extremely adept in these aspects of the practice he's uh he's in his 80s but he's um He's, he's Chinese from Hong Kong originally. He's one of these kind of like just encyclopedia repositories of martial arts. Um, people come to visit him from all over the world. He sort of doesn't have a sort of public school or anything like that. And he's retired now, but he's, he's, he's extremely advanced and adept in these aspects of the practice. And he talks about Qi a lot and he lets people feel him. Um, he demonstrates his abilities. It's not you know, sort of mystical woo-woo type chi stuff. It's just very energetic things having to do with the breath and and um, how you hold yourself. And um, I think of chi then as, uh, of course, there is a whole cosmology of chi in Chinese thought that's extremely important that, I, that I've studied, you know, academically. But I think of chi really as a, it's a, you could say it's a phenomenological term. It's a term that refers to how energy flows and is felt to flow in your body and in relationship to your mind and in your relationship to the environment, other people and the natural environment. And it's a, it's an experiential term. And um, I think it has uh, very much linked to the breath and the relationship between the breath and the mind. And um, I see it as having, you know, a lot of profundity in that context. I'm not particularly um, I'm actually rather skeptical of people who say, well, what she really is, is, you know, electromagnetic energy or some special field that science, you know, hasn't discovered or, you know, turns away from and refuses to acknowledge, or, you know, chi is really just, you know, in the body, your ability to sort of mobilize the fascia. I mean, yes, it has to do with the fascia, but that's a, a very simplistic and reductive way of thinking. So I'm not so interested in trying to take it as a concept and map it on in a reductive way to some other system. It has when you enter into the world in which that concept has descriptive um, uh, content and value, and you have a teacher who can guide you in that, then it has its own clarity and validity that you just you you learn as part of your part of your vocabulary, I suppose you could say. Yeah. One of the themes in the book that we're going to discuss today, uh, "Waking, Dreaming, Being," is the difference between uh, absolutism nihilism and what you call this a sort of a middle way um the enacted view which we'll we'll talk about that uh, a bit later and i wonder sometimes about uh, the question that i asked you already that when one takes a critical view or starts to apply critical apparatus to practice traditions um, that one might be practicing in or indeed religions that one might be a part of perhaps this middle way is a way of salvaging some ability to relate to them practically. In other words, my question to you is, what, why is it that you think you have not become post-practice in your mm -hmm. um, academic uh, study and critical examination? And indeed, I think, you know, attacking certain, cer certain sacred cows of, uh -huh. uh, yeah. of the traditions. How is it that you haven't become, if you want, nihilistic about it all or post-practice in that mm -hmm. sense? Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Well, for, diff for different reasons. So one is that um, when my life doesn't have it as part of uh, my daily rhythm, I notice that I don't feel as, uh, as good um, in, in, in the world and in, in my relationship to other people in my own embodiment. So, so that's a very sort of practical reason. Um, 
And I suppose I would say that, um, I mean, I think practice is, is, is valuable depending on the, on the context and community and teacher, of course. And my criticisms are not criticisms of practice. They're criticisms of certain things that people say and certain ways that think people package things and then kind of create a, a rhetoric or, or philosophy around that I think in some ways actually ultimately undermines the, the value of, of practice. So for example, you know, in our last interview, we talked about, you know, in my, in my Why I'm Not a Buddhist book, my objections to presenting meditation as if it were a kind of science where people really think of science as um, a matter of penetrating and manipulating things to see reality as it really is. And they, they think of science and outer science as like that. And then they take that idea of science and they transpose it, you know, inwardly into the mind and they present, you know, say Vipassana as if it was kind of like an inner, you know, microscope or telescope. This is a very sort of instrumental way of thinking about, about practice. And then when they do it, in the service of an end that's something like, you know, individual or personal well-being completely taken out of the context of, you know, the way that that gets um, put up as a kind of consumerist value, then um, that's where my, you know, my unhappiness um, uh, comes into play or my, or my, my critique comes into play, because I think that actually undermines the, um, the, the value of practice as a, as a, a you know a thing that that human beings do and can give value to their lives in the same way that um, if you were to treat art like that you would sort of miss the point of art if you were to instrumentalize it in in that particular um, sort of scientized uh, rendering. So in some ways you could say that I'm actually trying to create a proper space for an understanding of practice and its and its transformative effects. And my um, argument is, is with people who think that the way to do that is to, is to uh, give it a certain kind of scientific packaging. Buddhist exceptionalism, as you call it. In right, the... exactly. Yeah. 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 You know, the, part of the reason I'm drawing this theme out with my questions is there, there was a, a trend in certain of the, of the comments, seeing as we decided to address, address some of the themes, of mm. it seemed people feeling um, under threat. I've, I've practiced this, it's been valuable for me, it gives me certain uh, benefits, perhaps even in, you know, thinking in a certain way or practicing a certain way. And here, Evan's coming and spoiling the party, and mm -hmm. he's attacking it. You know, he's, why is he undermining Buddhism? Why is he, why is he threatening that? Uh, this is so meaningful to me. What, uh, what advice would you, I don't think you've done that uh, incidentally, but what advice would you give to somebody who's encountering that kind of a, uh, I suppose, could we say critical, um, mm -hmm. a critical approach, uh, yeah. and is wondering at how, how deeply that might press into, into the, the meaning that they derive from their religious practice or the religious association. Yeah, yeah. So uh, as I try to make clear in the book, my, my, my argument or critique is not meant to be one that would persuade somebody not to be a Buddhist. That's not actually what I'm arguing. One, I'm explaining how I, in my own thinking, um, found it really at the end of the day unacceptable to you know to take that step and make that identification. But I never, um, I never generalize from that and say you know any given individual should or shouldn't be a Buddhist. Um, and that's actually another thing that makes me different from Russell, because Russell really is trying to argue you shouldn't be a Christian. But I'm not trying to argue that people shouldn't be Buddhist. I think um, I, I think of myself as having a conversation with certain kinds of things that some Buddhists say in some contexts that I think is one, you could say, distortive of aspects of the tradition and doesn't withstand philosophical critical scrutiny. So it doesn't mean that um, if you if you feel at home in the Buddhist tradition or in a Buddhist community or in a Buddhist form of practice, you you shouldn't um, you shouldn't follow that. I never make that argument. Um, the argument is at a is at a different level. It's a it's a it's a philosophical argument about a um, a kind of cultural 
discourse about Buddhism that's happening in mod in the modern world that singles out Buddhism as as exceptional in a way that makes it special and different from other religions not by being unique because every religion is unique, but by being especially scientific. That's what I'm criticizing. So if somebody says, you know, I feel at home in the Buddhist tradition, um, you know, I love my Sangha, I love my practice, um, that's that's fantastic. Uh, that gives meaning to your life. I would never, I would never uh, attack that. Um, but if they were to say, and it's wonderful because um, because Buddhism is so scientific and I feel like I'm really being, you know, modern and scientific then I would say, well, wait a minute, that's actually not really correct. And we need to have a conversation about that. That's, that's how I would frame things. Fascinating. Thank you. Thanks for indulging some, uh, <laughs> some of my curated uh, YouTube comment questions there. Very cool. Yeah, great. Well, let's move on then to talk about waking dreaming being. You know, I'm curious, the key, this key idea is the central idea, if we, if we could say, is your idea is the self as an enacted process. And you differentiate mm -hmm. that from various other uh, conceptions of the self in, in neuroscience and also in different schools of Indian philosophy, having a kind of conversation between all those different traditions and including even, even modern thinkers like Thomas Metzinger and, and so on, you, you, you deal with him there. So I'm curious, you know, how long has it been now since you published this book? Quite some time, I'd say. Yeah. yeah, it's about 10 years. I was thinking about that this morning before, you know, logging on to have the conversation. So I, I really was, so the book was published in 2014. So that's almost 10 years. But that means, of course, I was writing it before. So I was I was really working intensively on the writing of this book from around 2009 to 2013. So it's a, it's a while ago now. And it was written very much in the context of uh, making uh, two trips to India for mind and life meetings with the Dalai Lama, um, participating um in uh, events in North America with Buddhists and including the Dalai Lama and and scientists, and I suppose in that context also thinking about um, you know my own personal kind of upbringing in a in a worldview that uh, that emphasized the importance of practice and meditation as we were talking about before, and then my my fascination really since i was a very little kid um with with how consciousness alters across the whole sleep wake cycle so particularly in the dream state and dreaming like some of my earliest memories as a kid are really of dreams and so dreams have always have always been this just very salient thing in my own inner you know inner life and i was raised in a family where people would talk about their dreams in the morning and so it was a very much a sort of shared thing of um of family life and so i was kind of pulling all those threads together in this writing of the book which is now about well really 15 years ago in terms of when i really first started working on it yeah yeah so i'm wondering if you might might reflect on that um and then i'd like to ask you some some specific questions about certain sections of the book we certainly won't be able to cover everything eight years on 15 years on is there anything you would add to that this is a book now. Mm. Anything you might disagree with uh, your former self? Uh, are there any ways in which your thinking is substantially or even, even yeah. in small ways changed on this subject? Yeah. So I should say it's it's it's. I've written a bunch of books, and um, so that's just you know part of what you do as a university professor, and also like to think of myself as a writer. It's my favorite book of the of all the books I've written. Um, um, it's the one that I think. I, I feel closest to personally in a way in terms of just the writing, the way that it tells different kinds of anecdotes and personal stories about my experiences and tries to weave that into the philosophy. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with how that kind of all came together in the end. And I really had to find myself into that way of writing. You know, when I started writing it, I was really, it was really, um, there was an effort to find the right voice. And I had a lot of people um, particularly my, my partner, who's a neuroscientist, you know, she, and she used to be a journalist. So she has a very good kind of writer sensibility for, you know, what, what sounds personal and, and, um, and, uh, meaningful and how to convey, you know, complicated ideas in a more, in a more immediate way. So I had to find myself into the, into the writing and, um, and that sort of changed my whole writing process and how I think about writing. So if I look back on it now, I would say that I'm st I still I still feel very um I suppose that you could say I still 
I still sort of stand by what I say in the book and by the book as a whole. The one thing that has that has evolved, in fact, is what we were just talking about, which is that I sometimes present practice in the book, meditation practice, as if it were, uh, let's say, more scientific than I now think of it. So I would say at that phase of my thinking, when I was very immersed in the science Buddhism dialogue and the sort of science of meditation conversation, I did think of, of, of meditation in ways that would, um, I think I was, I was sort of cautious and nuanced in how I said this, but I did, I did, you know, to, to simplify things, I did present it in a way that would lend itself to the idea of being an inner science. And that has really evolved for me. Um, I, I, I would now place a lot more emphasis on, um, the social aspect of meditation, the way that it happens in ritualized ways and ritual community, social context. So I would I suppose if I was writing the book now, I would I would emphasize more, you might say, a kind of anthropological perspective on on human experience and human practice than I than I did there. That would be maybe the one the one difference. Mm. Yes, that's very interesting. For those that perhaps haven't read the book, and I know this is a, this is perhaps a bit of a big ask. Can you summarize a little bit for us mm -hmm. the, the key theme, the, the, yeah. the themes, the central ideas, and, and you, you go at this from several angles, um, but I'm wondering if you if you might summarize for us the, the key themes of this book. Yeah. So the book is basically concerned with the um, self and consciousness. And by self, I mean our sense of self, our experience of, of, of being a self or or having a uh, having a selfhood, a sense of a sense of um, of identity in experience, or you could say of um, of uh, of our being a sub being subjects of experience. So I'm concerned. That's that's the, the the overarching theme of the book. And what I'm particularly concerned with is how our awareness and self awareness shifts across the states of consciousness that make up the sleep-wake cycle. So in the waking state, our sense of self is, I mean, let me back up actually even further. So I take a, I take a, a, a model, you could say, from, from really Indian philosophy across a number of different Indian traditions where a distinction is made between awareness, the contents of awareness, which come and go and change in various ways, and ways of identifying with contents of awareness as self or marking them as not self. So there's a there's a sort of three threefold structure there: awareness, contents of awareness, sense of sense of self. And I use that structure, which goes all the way back to the Upanishads in Indian philosophy, and I use it to track changes in them across different states, like waking, falling asleep, dreaming, lucid dreaming, deep sleep, out of body experiences, what happens in dying and death. And then I have a kind of summary of the idea that the self is a is a kind of ongoing process, the sense of self, the feeling of self is a kind of ongoing process under constant construction across all of these different states. And I weave together in my examination of these states, um, both first person experience, um, first person experience related also to to meditation, especially and med meditative practices that that try to observe or watch or be mindful of these states in their in their changing um characteristics and their in their dynamics and um <clears throat> so that's one source very much related to indian philosophical traditions <clears throat> another source is western philosophy of mind particularly contemporary discussions about consciousness and then the third source is neuroscience what 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 or cognitive science really the science of the of the mind um, what we've learned about these states through, um, you know, scientific investigations of the, the brain and the body and behavior and things like that. So I weave these, these elements all together in a, in a sort of like big spectrum, big spectrum picture of awareness, contents of awareness and the, the changing sense of, of, of self. I wonder if we might zoom in on the various different states of consciousness that you you describe in the book you 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 write some very interesting things about the similarities between dream and memory or mind wandering mm -hmm. or imagination and and also the impact of lucidity lucid dreaming for example and and, and its relationship to say everyday waking states mm -hmm. i wonder if, if you might say a little about that yeah 
So <clears throat> these these states of um, of imagination and memory and dreaming and lucid dreaming are interesting in the ways that within their <clears throat> within their content or within how we um, experience them, we can see how the sense of self is con is constructed in various ways. So so in the in the waking state, we we have a sense of of selfhood or being in the world as an individual that's you know very much grounded on the body. Um, if we're engaged and absorbed in something that you know is perceptually um, demanding, whether it's you know sitting at a computer and writing or playing the violin, uh, that sense of bodily self is very much you could say geared into um, the 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 changing environment with which one is um, to which one is related. Then we're also familiar in the waking state with how, you know, if we're doing something, especially if it might be rote or routine, our mind may drift away and we may become caught up in some in some train of thought. And often the content that makes up those trains of thought is, you could say, self-related in that we generate images of ourselves in the past. We might rehearse something that happened the previous day. Maybe we, you know, we had a disagreement with someone and we're sort of replaying it. No, I should have said this rather than that. Um, or maybe we're sort of projecting ourselves into the future, thinking about, you know, I have this demanding upcoming thing I have to do and how I'm going to deal with it. So we generate kind of forward and backward looking images of, of self that's now a sort of mental sense of self that's different from that immediate kind of bodily sense of self that's engaged in a, in a task. So that's kind of a basic sort of structure, if you could say, like our ordinary waking lives. And then as we, um, so some of that is made, made up of memory, of course. And also of imagination, because we're drawing on memory, but we're also imagining, we're, we're as it were, mentally simulating um, possible future states with some image of ourself and and past states. If you think if you think about memory, um, you know, if I ask you, um, you know, what was the first thing you remember uh, experiencing when you first uh, woke up today? Um, you know, some people will respond to that. They will, they will, they will sort of activate the memory in a first-person perspective. It's as if they're, you know, they're lying in the bed and they open their eyes and they look out and you know, there's the room. Um, if I if I ask you what were you feeling when you first woke up, uh, very much it's it's more likely that you'll have that kind of like um, first-person what psychologists call um, field memory, as if you're back in the you know, the field of the memory from a first person perspective. But if I ask you what you were wearing, um, the chances are you will have an outside view of yourself as if you were sort of hovering in some, you know, place above the bed, looking down on yourself and you see, you know, you're wearing like a shirt or pajamas or whatever, maybe you're not wearing anything at all, you know, whatever the case is. Um, but you'll see yourself from the outside. Of course, you didn't experience yourself from the outside. We're assuming that you know when you first woke up, you didn't have an out-of-body experience, so you you're not seeing yourself from the outside. So you're creating a kind of image of yourself from the outside in memory, and you can do that you know in your forward projection, and of course that can happen in a dream as well. You can experience in a dream yourself immersed in the dream from a from a first-person viewer field perspective, or you can experience yourself from the outside. So this is what psychologists, in the case of memory, call observer memory. So you see yourself from the outside. And um, in a dream, of course, if it's not a lucid dream, you don't um, you don't know you're dreaming. So you just there you are. You find yourself like looking at yourself from the outside as a character in the dream, or you experience a world um, from a you know a first person perspective where you're going out about and doing something in the dream. Maybe your body is very similar to the body you have in waking life. Maybe it's a different kind of embodiment. You know, you could dream you're a different gender or a different animal or you know what whatever. So it might not be the same. And then in a lucid dream, of course, all that, a, a very intense lucid dream in particular, all that shifts because you now have um, an awareness of yourself that includes yourself as dreamer and maybe even with recollections of previous lucid dreams or, or a, a full awareness that you're there lying in the bed. Um, and, and you have a sense of yourself in the dream immersed, which could be again from a first person or a third person, or uh, yeah, outside third person perspective. So you um, you have this very kind of complexified range of possibilities for for self experience how you experience 
the South in these in these different states, and they're all they're all um, sort of innerly linked. You know, imagination, memory, dreaming, lucid dreaming. Of course, out of body experiences in the waking state, where you you have an experience, or in, in a sleep state, or in the waking state, they can happen in different contexts, where you experience yourself from the outside. And it doesn't feel at all like a dream. It feels it feels real and vivid. But you feel, you know, here here I am up at the ceiling, and then there I am down below in the bed. You have um, two different, you know, images of yourself with a sense of identity that's partially below and partially above, and um, that then actually presents differently from how it presents in memory, where you know that in memory when you have that outside view that you're remembering, but in a, but in a full blown out of body experience, it doesn't feel like memory. It feels like, you know, it's happening here and now. So those are some of the like range of possibilities. And, um, and what I do in the book is I, I, tr I try to, you know, carefully describe them phenomenologically using examples from my own experience of, of all these different kinds of experiences, and then um, relate them to things we know about these experiences in, um, in cognitive science and the, you know, the study of the mind scientific study of the mind. Lucid dreaming, particularly, I think, fascinating area. Mm -hmm. um, you, you said that that's been quite a, a key interest for you. I, I wonder yeah. if you might say a little bit, uh, a bit about that, your own lucid dreaming, uh, I yeah. suppose, experience or practice. Is it something you still engage with actively? I, I do intermittently. I, when I was writing the book, I really engaged with it a lot um, in the sense of, you know, really writing down my dreams, keeping track of them, getting up in the middle of the night, you know, reading about dreaming, going back to sleep, doing all the kinds of, um, you know, things that uh, that increase the likelihood of having a lucid dream, um, taking naps, because that part of the sleep cycle, you know, opens up different sleep states as more likely, including sleep paralysis. I experimented a lot with sleep paralysis in, in, in napping in the writing of the book. Um, I don't really, I'm not doing that so much now, um, just because it's very demanding um, to really throw yourself into it. And uh, I don't quite have the same amount of time for it in my current life. But I, I spontaneously lucid dream reasonably frequently, I would say. Um, it's hard to say exactly how frequently it kind of comes and goes. Um but it's kind of always there for me as an experiential possibility, even if I'm not, I suppose you could say, actively cultivating it. I haven't always lucid dreamed, though. I, you know, I said earlier that you know I have some of my earliest memories are of dreams. You know, when I was a very little kid, I didn't really have, I would say, a what I would think of as a recognizably lucid dream. I had a lot of false awakenings um, at different points in my life, but I didn't have what I would consider to be a, a recognizably lucid dream um, until I was in my uh, early 30s, I guess. And it was actually when I went to Dharamsala for, for my first Mind and Life meeting with the Dalai Lama. And it was an extremely powerful, I write about it in the book, extremely powerful experience because um, you know, I had been reading about consciousness and and thinking, thinking that I wanted to write about consciousness, and I was going, you know, to present um, at this meeting with the Dalai Lama, sort of, you know, the Western philosopher's perspective on some of these questions. And I arrived in Dharamsala after probably, you know, close to forty-eight hours of travel to get there, you know, with a very, you know, jet lag and a very altered sleep cycle. And um, I woke up; it would have been in India, at maybe four in the morning. Um, having had this intense uh, lucid dream um, that was that was instigated by um, by flying in the dream and then realizing I was dreaming, I have I've had always had very intense flying dreams, but this was the first time it was lucid. You'd think if you were like always flying in your dream, you'd realize, oh, you know, I'm dreaming. It actually took me a long time to clue in, and um, so I had this very powerful lucid dream, and that actually was what first inspired me to really start writing Waking Dreaming Being was this dream I had in in India, which I sort of. I took kind of as an auspicious sign that, you know, I've made this journey to India. I'm in these very special circumstances, feeling very fortunate to have this opportunity. And then I have this very powerful lucid dream. And it was it was like a, a sign that, OK, this is something I, I should be working on. Um, and then I had a conversation a couple of days later in Dharamsala with Alan Wallace, who was there for the same meeting about lucid dreams and Tibetan dream yoga and that sort of perspective on um, on uh, on dreams and 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 dream yoga as a meditative practice.
Yes, the lucid dreaming, um, much like the holodeck in Star Trek, you know, yeah. I think I think of that and I think of all the different shenanigans that uh, occurred in the holodeck in Star Trek. Some right. people used it for, you know, Worf uses it for combat training, uh, others use it for entertainment, mm -hmm. you know, or uh, re relaxation, etc. Mm -hmm. And indeed, as you pointed out, Milam Naldro, as it's sometimes called, the dream yoga mm -hmm. of the Tibetan tradition has very uh, elaborate and interesting missions to accomplish right. in the in the in the lucid state so i'm i'm curious what you have explored in that did you go through a kind of a tibetan dream yoga style curriculum of transformations yeah and et cetera, et cetera? not yeah not really because uh i mean that really i think i mean you could try to do it yourself in your own sort of auto practice but um but i think that really requires working closely with it with it with a teacher who can who can guide you in that um and i didn't i didn't ever really follow that kind of structured um approach and that that structured approach particularly if it's framed in a tibetan buddhist way makes sense as part of a larger you know way of life and practice as a tibetan buddhist um, um so i so i i didn't do that but i did have um I got pointers, you might say, from from conversations with different people. So that first conversation with Alan, um, that was that was a great conversation because what I tried to do when I had the lucid dream is I tried to meditate. I I had this realization, oh, I'm in the dream state, um, you know. And I had read I had read books about Tibetan dream yoga before I had the lucid dream, and I had had conversations with my my you know close friend and mentor Francisco Varela um, about the dream state and and meditations in dreams. And um, so I, I tried to meditate and I, I tried to meditate by like actually sitting down in the dream and like meditating as you would in, in real life. And, and that just basically made the dream kind of fragment and fall apart. And it kind of kicked me into the waking state. So I told Alan this and Alan said, I said, oh, no, you shouldn't do that. You should, because if you, if, you, if you attenuate the content of the dream by sort of, you know, sitting and quieting your your sense of embodiment as you would in waking life, then the dream will just go away. You'll just wake up. What you need to do is you need to keep generating dream content. So you need to move, you need to spin, um, but you need to keep the, you know, try to keep the lucidity. And then eventually that, you know, moves into the practice of transforming the dream, you know, moving from recognizing the dream to transforming it, to see the kind of plasticity of the mind, particularly transforming you know, negative emotions into positive ones. So, you know, if it's a nightmare, transforming fear or or anger or aggression into, you know, loving kindness or compassion. Um, so, you know, I I subsequently explored that. I, I, I definitely took on board the idea that I need to keep moving. And so I tend to have lucid dreams a lot with flying. And so that then became very easy. It's just like, okay, I'll just keep flying. Um, and... That, that I explored a fair bit. I don't tend to have them in the context of nightmares, um, but the dream state is emotionally, you know, labile. So you can go from positive to negative emotions quite quickly in a dream. Um, so I, I worked with trying to, um, to, recognize, to recognize that. And I would say that, um, yeah, that was, that was something I tried to really kind of go into in depth, but not in a systematic structured way as i would if i you know had a teacher who was kind of guiding me yeah, yeah. did you try to do walking through walls and things like that I'm yeah, curious. yeah i did that so that was another thing alan said he said you know um walk through you know walk through walls um and i had no problem with that some people you know i think find that difficult but the the walking through walls um uh wasn't a problem although the very first time i did it i walked through a wall and it was into a space of blackness and then i just woke up because it was like the content disappeared again mm -hmm. so i had to kind of do that more in a way that would keep the dream alive as it were but um yeah i didn't i didn't have um i didn't have any issues i'm trying to think of other things i've done i didn't really have any problems with the walking through walls um the 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 keeping moving and 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 keeping a kind of meditative presence of mind while moving is tricky. I do find that that's challenging because you can very easily get sucked into the the holodeck, as it were, of of the of the dream. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I do tai chi in dreams because that's movement and it's meditative. Um, that's great. I have sometimes I have these amazingly um, powerful tai chi dreams where 
um, you know, teachers who who belong to one lineage I've I've studied in a lot who I never met because they they died really before I studied Tai Chi are there giving me instructions and you know I'm pushing hands with them and those dreams are fantastic I love those dreams and sometimes they're lucid sometimes they're not. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, I'm I'm so fascinated by by the subject. Um, I myself have absolutely no talent for lucid dreaming and I've taken a few <laughs> runs at it. Uh -huh. uh, this was recently exposed uh, in an interview with I was doing a dialogue, recording a dialogue between Dr. Nida and um, Chanet Sang and and uh, Dr. Ian Baker. Uh -huh. And Dr. Nida uh, asked if I uh, was a dreamer, was I much of a dreamer? And I had to I was forced to admit that I, in fact, have no talent for it. Whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, anyway. there's a lot of, yeah, a lot of individual variation. You know, I teach this as part of my, you know, when I teach a philosophy of mind course on consciousness, you know, to, uh, to my undergraduate students or to my, you know, graduate students here in Vancouver at University of British Columbia, you know, I find that um, there's a lot of variation, you know, some, some, some students, um, you know, they, they have the very active dream lives and they really, they really sort of um, have already, you know, discovered lucid dreaming and kind of gone down that rabbit hole and other people really don't have much of a sense of having a dream life at all. So there's there's definitely, you know, a lot of individual variation, I think. Mm. Another aspect of the book that I'd love you to touch on a bit and um, remind you a bit actually of Douglas Harding's Little Douglas uh, mm. narrative, which I'm sure you, you know, you're not, was the arising of the self complex. So you describe yeah. the self more or less as a, a sort of interdependent process. It's not a. It's there. It's not that there is no self, or it's not that the self is a particular thing. It's a sort of interdependent process, and I'd like to talk about that a bit later. I can ask you about Yogacara mm -hmm. and Yamaka and how you mm -hmm. how you um, right. uh, match that with reductionism and your your and your enacted view. I think that was particularly interesting. Nonetheless, one might ask, well, where does the sense of self come from? When does this process initiate? You write about that in a very fascinating way to do with joint cognition, uh, joint cognition mm -hmm. and things. So I wonder if you might comment on that and yeah. uh, if you see any similarities with, with uh, Douglas Harding's Little Douglas. Uh, right, line. right. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, so when I talk about the sense of self as a construction or the self as an ongoing process of construction, there's there's many different things that go into the construction. So so one is the the bodily sense of self that, you know, comes from from, um, you know, having a body with, you know, interoceptive, proprioceptive, kinesthetic feelings of itself, you know, from within and in movement. Um, that's, that's one aspect of the, you could say, the, the, the basic bodily sense of self. And we know from a biological point of view that, that that's a very complexly orchestrated kind of thing that has to do with, a, you know, a dialogue between the brain and the body and, and, other, um, and other systems and, uh, the relationship of, of perception and movement to the environment. And then the, the mental sense of self that we were, that we were just talking about before, where you can have a sense of yourself in memory, either from within or looking at yourself from without that from a cognitive science perspective is something that we know is tied to the developmental maturation of social cognition. So in the, um, in the development of the infant, the 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 infant at around you know standardly, I guess it would be said around you know ten to fourteen months in a sort of there's a developmental period where the where the infant's um, capacity for what's called joint attention really matures. So joint attention is when you know if you're a baby, you know you're looking at the toy and you're also looking at say your mother. And you're able to follow your mother, the movement of your mother's eyes. She's also looking at the toy, and you're able to, through following the eye gaze, know that you're both paying attention to the toy. So there's this experience of a kind of shared attention of of being in a world with other subjects, sharing attention to an object, and then that can can complexify in which the object of shared attention is you yourself. So your your bodily kind of being in the world, presence in the world, is understood as the object of attention of the mother through seeing, you know, the mother looking at you. So the eye gaze, you know, moves from the toy to you. So there's this sense that there is another seeing you from the outside, and you are there in the world in relationship to another. So the social intersubjective uh, experience. And that becomes, you could say, uh, internalized in a way that gives us an internal structure where we can see ourselves from the outside 
in our own mental simulations in in memory or indeed in dreams so these things you know psychologists call these things social cognitive capacities tied to metacognition where you have a, a kind of cognition of a of another cognition it could be you're cognizing the other cognizing you or you're cognizing your own previous cognitive experience via memory or you're projecting it forward in time so that internal metacognitive sense of self is inherently social it's it's um it's an internalization of something that arises developmentally as a as a social phenomenon and so actually as an aside i talk about this in why i'm not a buddhist um, certain styles of meditation practice that rely on metacognitive monitoring, so certain ways of practicing surveying or, or metacognitive memory, which in a way is what sati or smriti is. It's this kind of keeping the mind on track by holding the object and not sort of wobbling away from it. That metacognitive capacity that we human beings have, that is something that arises developmentally first as a social cognitive achievement and then becomes internalized. So, so mindfulness meditation and that sense of mindfulness is, is riding on social cognitive um, capacities, which means from a cognitive architecture point of view, it is an inherently social phenomenon. And this is why I dislike certain ways of rendering that as a kind of private internal monitoring of your own mind. Yes, in a sense it is, but it's a monitoring of a mind that is the way it is because it's being socially constructed and configured. And, um, and, and, and that's, you know, because it goes back to this development of joint attention. You know, of course, in Buddhism, there are many ideas about the self across the history of Buddhism. Nuances, in other words, about the self. There is a persistent theme that in some way, under, coming to a clearer understanding about the self, there is of course variation across Buddhism as to what that understanding ought to be, it has consequences for the individual practitioner, uh, liberation, for example, or uh, perhaps more specifically, reduction of suffering, mm -hmm. or maybe even access to a certain kind of uh, gnosis, for example. So I'm curious, how does your thinking track with the idea that somehow if we can only understand the self better, be that that there isn't one, or be that that it's an inactive process, or be that that it's actually Brahman or something like this, you know, these yeah. sorts of ideas you touch on, or many of them in the book, um, have some sort of, uh, if you want, dare I say, instrumental use for the well being and, may and maybe even, you know, ex experience of the world of the practitioner. How does your thinking track with some of those claims made, made in, for example, the various schools of Buddhism? Well, I, I would see there being a very, very general um idea or commitment across many traditions that you know we could use the socratic you know delphic injunction know thyself to to articulate so whether we're talking about you know the emergence of philosophical thinking in greece and in, in plato and socrates or we're talking about the upanishads and the the injunction to to truly know the self or whether we're talking about um, how Buddhism arises in that culture and critiques the idea of self, um, or whether we're talking about, you know, Confucianism and the idea of understanding the self in terms of of virtues that need to be cultivated in relation to others. The, the over uh, overarching project, you might say, there is one that that is focused on self knowledge or self wisdom. And as a philosopher, I'm I you know I'm committed to that as a as a as a path I suppose you could say, and so I would see my own work in waking dreaming being as just a little little sliver of that very large human project that takes different cultural and, and philosophical forms. In the in the more specific case of Buddhism, I mean Buddhism takes a particular stance. In relationship to that question that that of course you know evolved and changes historically uh, as buddhism develops but you could say that in the um the the ideas that we see in the in the in the suttas in 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 pali and the way that they reflect and interact with you know the the immediate cultural context of that time there is a there is a a, a view that emerges where it's a mistake to identify anything that's 
that's available in the field of experience as self, um, because none of it meets the criterion of what a self would would have to be, and that that insight then is is liberating or 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 freeing, and I think that um, even if one doesn't necessarily at the end of the day accept everything about that viewpoint i mean so so you know hindu philosophers would accept some of it but then they would say yes that's true for the body and the mind but then there's this you know atman that isn't disclosed that way so just leaving you know leaving uh, aside the complexity of that of that issue which i mean i'm happy to talk about but just kind of putting that to the side i would say that um that the understanding of the self and the mind in philosophical wisdom traditions and 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 now today through the development of modern psychology and 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 science that's an absolutely uh, crucial project for 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 creatures like us who find ourselves in a complex entangled relationship with each other and the world and who don't really understand how we work or or um you know who 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 need to make an effort to to understand their own their own constitution and their and their own being, so I do see it as a as an inherently um, investigative, liberative path or 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 project in very general terms. Now, if, if it if it if it then becomes a discussion about a, a specific notion of awakening, because if we invoke a word like awakening or enlightenment, well, I mean that doesn't carry its meaning on its sleeve, as it were. That means many different things in many different contexts, according to different traditions and, and how it's articulated. I mean, then we would have to have a more fine-grained kind of discussion. But in very general terms, that would be my that would be my response to the to the question. And what about the claim that a clearer understanding of the self, whichever understanding is being proposed, will reduce the suffering? of the individual what do you what do you what do you think of that particular yeah. that claim that, that and the mechanisms that are being implied there yeah um I, I so a lot hangs on what understanding means there um and what one does with the understanding <laughs> so i think that um simply let's let's put it this way simply um sitting as a solitary meditator and seeing the, you could say, inherent flux and instability of the mind-body continuum and the tendency constantly to try to identify with one or another aspect of it, seeing that, having it disclosed to you immediately and experientially, does not in and of itself make you a better person, make you an ethical person, it make you helpful to others. It really depends on the context, like what you get up and then do in action, in speech, in relationship to others. And that's why traditionally you, you know, you, you need that kind of experience to be placed within, if we're talking within Buddhism, within the context of right view, right action, and so on in and of itself. Um, I mean, in fact, we, 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 we know this, I suppose you could say in terms of how some of those experiences happen for people today, we know that in some people, that can lead to profoundly um, dissociative, distressing states. That it doesn't reduce suffering. That it actually um, that it actually leads to further suffering. So there, I really think it depends on um, on the on the person, on the context. For some people, that kind of practice might a might actually not be very uh, very advised. It, it 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 really depends. But if but if one if one were to say something like you know that practice in and of itself is a is a is a remedy for suffering or makes the world a better place, then I would say that's just that's just naive and uncritical. No, I mean there there are so many things that are required to do to um, to make the world a better place if we want to put it in that way. And many of them I think come down to um, to helping others and 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 trying to be of of, of benefit and service to others. And that doesn't mean, you know, giving away everything about yourself, but it means cultivating yourself in a way where you're living a life that really helps other people in, in beneficial ways. And I, I think that's more important than, than anything else, really, at the end of the day. So those kinds of meditative realizations can, of course, be conducive to that, but they're not necessarily. They have to be placed in relation to other things to make them conducive to that. That's my, that's my own view. 
Okay. You're returning there once again, it seems, to the social. Yeah. And you've, you've said the social is, is crucial in uh, the arising of the sense of the self. You, you discussed that with that joint attention. And now you're returning to it again as one of the key markers of the usefulness, I suppose, or uh, uh, of, of a deeper understanding of the self. When we think of the social, what implications to that does that have for the practitioner and for the practice of, of in particular, practices designed to investigate the self? Because, of course, often these practices are, like you said, it's solitary. It's some sort of private internal insight is then one goes up to the mountain, and then comes back down from the mountain again. Right. But if if the social is, is key at the beginning and you're saying the social seems key at the end, if we, if we consider an unfolding insight into the self and its consequences to be the end, so to speak, and a sort of open ended yeah. end, what about the middle? Yeah, right. What can the social tell us about the way we ought to investigate the self, um, contrasted with that solitary archetype of, of the practitioner? Yeah. Well, what, so one thing I would say is that the solitary archetype is actually a social archetype, right? Because if you're, I mean, if you're a hermit up in the mountain, hermit is a social category, right? It means you've withdrawn from others. Of course, you've been raised with others. Now you're withdrawing maybe for just a period of time, maybe not your whole life, maybe your whole life. Some societies recognize the role of the hermit as a social category. They support it. So they bring you offerings of food or they sustain you because they see your, you know, your solitary project as as worthwhile. So all of that is 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 social uh, already. If we're thinking of of the project or one project as investigating the mind, let's say uh, understanding ourselves through investigating the mind, then I I do think that science and our culture in general um, needs to create a space for the kind of um, experiential investigation, phenomenological investigation in which meditation can be can be very useful. And so um, there should be a kind of recognized social value on communities of practitioners um, cultivating these kinds of these kinds of meditative skills that can be a benefit in providing information experiences that enrich our sense of of you know what the mind is and and what 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 the human mind is capable of you might say um so that's kind of in the in the middle the 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 larger framing is um how the culture tries to create value out of that for you know deepening our scientific appreciation of the mind um the importance of that for for cultivating uh, an awareness of ethical qualities, you know, states of mind as they embody in in um, ethical qualities or virtues, you might say, and 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 action. So placed in that larger, I, I, I'm talking in a way, actually, I suppose, where you could summarize it under education. You know, we 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 in the modern world have you know very um, we have forms of education that are sort of unprecedented in human history. We have very advanced forms of knowledge. But we don't have an education of the mind in that in that sense of uh, of mental cultivation. So making a place for that educationally, that I think would be of great benefit, and is something that um, you know there are people who are who are working on uh, certainly to to advance this. It becomes delicate because in a secular world, um, you have to think of how these these practices can be made appropriate for people, for example, say in public schools, um, who, you know, don't want to be given instruction in Buddhism or Hinduism or, or, or Christianity for that matter. It, you know, there needs to be a kind of public secular way of, of educating the mind that can draw from these practices, but can't present them as they would in a religious context. And that's something that I think we're kind of currently struggling with. There's, there's a lot of kind of, tension and uncertainty about, you know, how to do that. And a lot of pushback against it, of course, um, especially in the United States and, um, you know, for all the obvious political reasons. Thank you. Uh, perhaps my last question then, your piece about Yogacara, Madhyamaka, or um, maybe we could say Vasubandhu and Chandakirti meets Mex Mexinger, Metzinger versus, <laughs> uh, Me versus Thompson. <laughs> right, right. Um, that, was a, that was a wonderful piece. I wonder if you might Give us a bit of a flavor of that. Yeah. So the the idea there is the idea of an understanding of 
self that is, you could say, a, a middle way understanding. And now I'm using middle way in my own sense. I don't necessarily mean as a as a as a Buddhist Madhyamaka or Yogacara thinker would understand that concept. Um, but what I mean by that is that um, there are two, you could say, extreme views in our current thinking about the self. One is the idea that there there is a real self and it's a thing or an entity or in philosophical language it's a it's a substance something that has its own kind of independent self-standing existence um that's one extreme and then what we see much more in this sort of rhetoric of philosophers and scientists today is the what i would identify as the other stream is that there is no self the self is an illusion it's an illusion created by the brain for the purposes of its own, you could say, efficiency of functioning, that it, 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 the brain needs to model itself and create an impression of their being a self, even though there, there really is, there really is no self. So that's, that's more or less Thomas Metzinger's view. Um, so my view is kind of in between those two. It, it's a, it's a middle way in that I think that um, there is a self, it's not a thing or an entity, it's a process. And it's a process under constant um, construction, and it has important, you know, functional roles. Autobiographical memory is very important. You know, projecting yourself into the future is very important. If you didn't have these capacities, your your existence would be, you know, diminished and and impaired. So there there is a sense of self that is functionally important, and and that does constitute a self as a process, but not a thing or an entity, and it's not an illusion created by the brain it's a construction created by the brain body and environment working together in in a relational inseparably relational way so i see that as a middle way in in an, an analogous sense to the way buddhists use the term middle way between you know a sort of absolutist view there is a real a real self a nihilist view there is no self whatsoever um a middle way would be um the kind of what i call an active view that the self is enacted in and through the the body, including the brain's relate relationship to the world and especially other beings. The the social context again being um, being crucially important there. Thank you very much, Evan. Fascinating conversation. Waking, dreaming, being. I must recommend it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. What are your upcoming projects? What are you What are you working on at the moment? Is that something you can you yeah. can feel? Yeah, I can. Uh, I just finished a book that's now off to the publishers that's co-written with two physicists, uh, Adam Frank, who's an astrophysicist, and Marcelo Gleiser, who is a theoretical physicist, both in the United States. And our book is called The Blind Spot, Experience, Science, and the Search for Reality. And it will probably be out in about a year. And it is a book about how... In our scientific worldview, we have come to think of science as a path to knowing reality independent or outside of our um, human form of experiencing the world. And so we call this into question and point, to, point out that this way of thinking leads to a number of paradoxes and conundra, um, con conundra in um in all the areas of science ranging from um, cosmology, the understanding of time, quantum physics, artificial intelligence, the, the theory of life, mind, consciousness. And then we end with a discussion of how this way of thinking uh, also impacts our understanding of the planet as a whole in Earth system science. So it's a very broad sweep kind of overview of um, the historical emergence of, you could say, a, a kind of reified or objectified way of, of thinking about science. And we're trying to recover um, the importance of the human form of experience for the continued sustenance and, and viability of the, of the scientific project. So that book should be probably 2024, that book will be out. Um, it just We just delivered the manuscript, just went into production. The other book I'm working on uh, actually grows out of Waking Dreaming Being. It grows out of the chapter on dying and death in Waking Dreaming Being, and and it's an expansion of that into a into a whole book on the theme of of the the transformative experience of dying, and it draws specifically from um, the use of of contemplative perspectives and practices in the context of hospice 
and what we're learning about the dying process from the the science of the mind, the the, the neuroscience of the of the dying brain, you could see, and trying to weave those perspectives um, together. So that book is just in the early stages of writing. Do you have a provisional title for that? That's called Dying: Our Ultimate Transformation. Fascinating. Both both sound absolutely incredible. Thank you once again, Dr. Evan Thompson. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.